Sure. Mighty Savers, we come before you this morning. We ask, Lord, that <coughs> let each and every one of our hearts be open and our ears that we might hear the word this day. Anoint the word, Mighty Savers, as it comes forth, Lord. Hallelujah. We just ask, Lord, that you bless each and every song this Sunday morning. Give us that privilege of you to praise the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. Happy Father's Day, Father. Thank you. You do. You do. We are not. Yeah, we're sorry. You do, old man. You don't you? Hey. Hey, we're here to celebrate the great father and mother. That's right. That's right. He's, he's the main father. Right? We'll be reading from Matthew chapter 5, 22 through 36. Say amen. Say amen. Amen. I'll start. Y'all follow. <coughs> but I'll say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, but Yes, that's right. Matthew. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, it's Mark. 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 Mark chapter five. Mark chapter five. Twenty-two to thirty-six. I don't have it. Amen. Twenty-two. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Again. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus. By name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he saw him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people called him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years. And he. <laughs> And he had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and nothing better, better, but rather be worse. When she had heard Jesus came into the press of mine and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that the two had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched thee? And he looked around about to see her that he that had done this thing. And that the woman and trembling, and only what was done in her, And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole in thy plague. While he yet say, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house a servant which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And you suffer no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Amen. Amen. Christ is made to be dismissed. <laughs>
We can't see any of that. We know this is here. We believe it's here. Nobody can tell us it isn't. But God, you can't. God is invisible. God is, is somewhere out there beyond what we, in our five senses, can see, can tell. We have to have faith. We have to have that firm belief that He is there. And we have to take the Spirit of the Holy Ghost that's in us and connect with Him. And that Holy Ghost is what firms up that belief in God, firms up our faith in God. Some of the things that God brought to me over the last few days, there was four things that God gave me on how to increase your faith. Four examples. The first is to hear it. And Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If faith is a firm belief in something that there's no proof of, then we have to hear the word to increase our faith. If you would turn for a moment, just temporarily, to John chapter 1. <clears throat> Because everything I tell you, I want to back up by Scripture to show you that this is what God's Word says is true on how you do this. So in John chapter 1, starting at verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In the beginning... The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So to increase your faith in the thing that you cannot see, you cannot touch, you cannot smell, you have to hear the Word according to Romans. And if you skip down to verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh, and He dwelt among us. Amen. The Word is Jesus. Amen. If you go back over here to these verses that I read this morning, and you go down to verse 27, it says, When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched His garment. So to increase your faith, you have to hear the Word. This woman with the issue of blood heard the word, Jesus. And she knew at that point in time, he was her help. Her faith had been increased when she heard the word because Jesus is the word. He was made flesh and dwelt among us. So for us to increase our faith, to continue growing in our faith, we have to hear the word. We have to hear about Jesus. We have to hear what he taught as well as what God, through the Holy Spirit, inspired others to tell us. Well, you've got to stand on the Word of God and wait upon Him. I waited 12 years for this old man here. I, he asked me to marry at one time, and I bought a wedding dress, and it hung in that closet. And all the kids said, what do you mean he's not going to never marry? I said, yes, he is going to marry. And he wasn't in church. One day he said, will you marry me? And I said, yeah, but he heard me. The brother heard me say, anybody want to get married? <laughs> and we got married, and we had a beautiful wedding at the church, the old church over there. But I waited 12 years, and I had that same wedding gown that I had bought and hung there for 12 years. So you got to wait on God for a lot of things. Right. Right. You have to wait. You have to stand upon it. You have to hear it. <laughs> and hearing it is the key, is the first key of it. Yes. In the Hebrews 11, we read all those scriptures, substance is no. That's in my list, yeah. Substance of things. Substance. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Verse 2 says, you know, by, by it, for by it, the elders are one. Have a good reward. Mm -hmm. to their faith. Yes. So hearing it is the first step. 
in establishing and growing your faith. Because you know what? When we're out in the world, you know, there's some of us that have been lucky enough that we've been raised in church. And we've been raised around God. So that, that has been ingrained in us from the beginning, from an early age, from the time we knew and can remember. <coughs> but there are people out in this world that have not had that experience. And you know what? What establishes a trust or a faith in God is the word we speak to them, the word of Jesus Christ. That's what starts establishing that in a person. And I know there's probably several here that didn't have that experience growing up, but growing up in a, a <coughs> church <coughs> family and a God-believing family, that somewhere in their life, somewhere along the line, someone spoke the word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And someone spoke that word to them and put it in their soul. Then someone else spoke the word, and someone else spoke the word. And guess what? God can move. That faith could start establishing in that person, what if there is a God out there? What if there is something bigger than myself? That's the, the start. That's that seed that they talk about. That seed that someone plants and another comes and waters. That seed that starts is faith. The seed is faith. Because God is the Word. And that's how we establish that faith. You're full of, full of stuff today. I'm like, I'm <laughs> um, oh, when, I, yeah, when I was at that point <clears throat> for uh, for sort of word stuff, and I, I said, if there is a God, you know, He can save me at home. I don't need to be in an altar of church. Or he can save me at home, man. And He did. Save me at home and by my will, so and tell me what the Lord And, you know, and, and, yeah. and, I, and I've heard and many accounts said, of that. My brother's brother said, Yeah, something really changed. Mm -hmm. you know, and and I, I've heard many people tell that, that same type of account that someone spoke the word, spoke Jesus Christ into their life, and something grew, and something, start, something in there started questioning. What have I been believing all this time? What is it I've been doing? Why now? Am I just here for this? And, and they start questioning and they say, God, you know what? If you are God and you are out there, I don't have to be here. I could be here or I want you to do it here. And God will prove himself to that person. Because he will do what it takes to get that person into the body of Christ. Right. And many, many people have told those same type of accounts, saying that they were saved, sitting in, a, in their front room, kneeling beside their bed, out by the wood pile, wherever it may have been. I tried to wasn't big enough for me to run in. So <laughs> I, I ran to the bathroom, and, and the, the mirror was all foggy, and it just got real clear. Like, you know, just... God will prove himself. And the first step in that is to hear it. To hear the word of God spoken into your life. And then to start hearing it more and more to increase that faith that's in your life. The second step that God gave me is to believe it. Verse 26 says, only believe. Be not afraid. God has now spoken his word into Jairus' life. Jairus has now heard it. He has seen in front of him a miracle that's just been done. And he looks at Jairus and says, Be not afraid. That is the word that God spoke to him. That's the word that Jairus then had to take into his life. <coughs> and he told him, Only believe. <coughs> we have to believe the word we are given. In John chapter 20, verse 29, it says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. We are a blessed people to have taken the word that's been spoken into our life and hear it and believe it. Because we cannot see Jesus. He did not walk physically among us like he did the disciples. Thomas would not believe the other 11 disciples that Jesus had been there, that he had been raised from the dead. We call him Downing Thomas. 
But he wasn't necessarily doubting. He didn't have that full belief that it was going to happen. He didn't understand. He wanted God to prove it to him. He wanted to see for himself. He wanted it happen. He wanted to have that experience for himself. And so many of us want that experience for ourselves. And you know what? God will honor that to a point. He will give us the experience. He will give us that time, that miracle, whatever it may be. Just getting saved by your wood stove at home instead of at an altar in the church. Whatever it is we need to get to the point He wants us to be, He will give it to us. But at some point in time, Jesus and God are going to say, Be not afraid, only believe. And what we have to do is only believe. We have to make that determination that, you know what? Everything out there is telling me this is not the way it is. But I believe that it is. I have to make that conscious effort to say, I don't care what they say. What the world shows me, I'm going to believe. You know, we're all flesh. And, you know, you and we, and we kind of get weak. You know, you know what Brother Pat said. Our flesh wants to cry out of, why don't God heal him? Why don't God heal Shekinah? You know, and I really get aggravated and angry sometimes. But like Joe says, yeah, no, he'll say me. I'm yeah, serving, you know. And we, that's where we just got to stand in and still continue to believe that God is God. And he will do it. He will, mm -hmm. do it. he will do it in his time. There is a point that he just has to tell us only believe. And that really dictates whether we are firm, grounded, establishing God, or if we're wishy washy. And we're just playing church. That really tells us who we are on the inside. <coughs> You know, I know you, you all probably have heard way more about the first six months of my life this year than you want to. But you want to know something? This first six months of this year has really established something for me. My mom was diagnosed with cancer at the end of January. She died April 8th. You know, just a little over two months later. My faith had to be firm. My faith had to be grounded. My faith had to be established in God to believe that no matter what, God's hand was in it all. That was a point in time in my life when God said, do not be afraid, only believe. Whether I believed that God would heal her outright and she would live many more years, or I believe that God would do what He sees best. I had to believe. I believe that God would heal her. Nothing more, nothing less. And that belief, and that healing came from <coughs> death. <coughs> there is a healing in death because she no longer has that cancer. Amen. She no longer has that pain. Amen. I had to believe and hold on to the fact that she would be healed one way or another. Now let me tell you, I was a little like Thomas in some respects because your flesh gets in, your mind gets to play, the devil comes in and he tries to sow those seeds of doubt in you saying, you're believing something that isn't real. Right. What do you think you're doing? You need to do something here. She's not going to make it. And there's no God that can save her. The devil will do that to you. And trust me, it gets hard. It gets hard to fight a battle like that. Many times I went pretty low. But you know what? There was that faith, that seed that was in me, that I had been increasing over time by hearing the Word of God, by believing the Word of God, that it stuck there. And even in those lowest moments, when I was most down, when I could have went either way, that seed stayed there and said, only believe. You have seen too much to turn back now. <clears throat> you need to go forward. I know it hurts. I know you're sad. I know there's pain. There's going to be a break in that fellowship.
But you have to believe that God's will is in this. And I came to that. And God has, he has really increased in me a knowledge and an awareness. <clears throat> Only because I believe. And it's all Him. Nothing to me. He took me from a small child, raised in a family with a dad who could not read or write, with a mom who was at a third grade reading level, who did what they had to do, a man who couldn't read. And I was thinking about this this morning and last night as coming up on Father's Day, that I, I miss my father tremendously. He's been gone almost 13 years now. It, it does. It's, it's been such a long time. And today to be Christopher's 21st birthday, too. You know, it'd be Father's Day. There's so much that's went on. And I stopped and I thought, God, you, you read, put me in this family and give me a father who, by the world's standards, should not have been able to accomplish a thing. More than just the bare minimum to survive. All right? Someone who cannot <coughs> read and write shouldn't be able to hold much of a job or do much of anything or make an income or make a life for himself. Not only did he do this, he worked many, many years, became good at what he did, hot carrying, stuck with it, showed faithfulness to his job. He showed faithfulness to his job and did it. He not only had did that, he became a preacher. A man who cannot even read one word in this book heard the word, increased his faith, and believed that he could do what God told him that he was going to do. Amen. And he did it. He became a great man of God. He could preach the word better than any person that I know. Amen. And I'm not being prejudiced by any means. He? He, he could show you the word and make it alive. Yes. So anyone could understand it. And that's why God did use him. Because God knew that there is people out here that needed that word to be made alive to them. He was in the moment, in his season, at the right time for the right people. He would use such examples, and we still talk about it today. And I thought about that overnight. He's been gone almost 13 years. And we still talk about the tree planted by the water. Amen. And him trying to dig that tree and pull it yeah. and tug it. Yeah. That tree was there because it got established, just like our faith gets established Amen. in us. God set him before me. 25 years of my life i got to spend with this man. God sent him before me to show me faith in action. Because this man believed he could do what God said he could do. Even when the world said it was impossible or thought it was impossible. So many preachers that he went to preach for had no idea that he could not read or write. He didn't tell them. He found no reason to tell them. He knew what God put in his heart. He knew it was sound. And so he brought that forth. And God honored that and opened the doors to people who had no idea. He traveled all over this part of the country evangelizing. So many times, so many weekends we spent in Virginia and West Virginia and Ohio and Tennessee. All over the state of Indiana. <coughs> that was with a man who couldn't read or write and a woman who could only read at a third grade level. And we traveled everywhere preaching God's word. You, you tell us that story to anyone out in this world and they would be going, there is no way. I saw it. I lived it. Only believe. Be not afraid of what's coming up ahead of you. Only believe. If my dad had been afraid to step out and said, I can't do that because I can't read. I can't read the scriptures. I can't read them in church. Where would he have been? But instead, he only believed. 
No matter what, he knew God would make the way for him. God would fix it for him. God set me in this family. I spent many, many years looking scriptures up, reading scriptures from the Bible, helping my dad find the scriptures he was looking for because he heard a word. He listened to the Bible on tape. He listened to teaching. He listened to every type of broadcast you could find. And he would hear a word on the way home on the radio and come home. And he wouldn't even get changed out of his clothes. He's covered in cement and concrete and all that and nasty, yucky. And the first thing, if you work in concrete, you know you want to get that stuff off of you. Right? He would come in and set, the, set his lunchbox down and everything else. And he'd go grab his Bible. I need you to find this. I heard something. I heard this. He heard the word. The word of Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And every time he heard that word, it increased his faith and just put it in his heart that he could do what God called him to do. And I spent many, many hours looking for that word. And every time that I looked through that word as a child, God put more faith in me. So not only was it my dad's faith increasing, my faith was increasing because God established that word in my heart. It was a win-win. Really, it was a win-win. He believed in the word. He had no reason not to. He had nothing to lose because he didn't have anything to begin with. He believed. And even when he was killed, my faith had to stand strong. I wasn't in church, and I talked about this a while back. I wasn't in church, but God set the word ahead for me. His last scriptures he preached was on Psalms 91. For the arrow that flieth by day, don't be afraid, the arrow that flieth by day, nor the terror that cometh by night. And for my dad to be shot with an arrow and killed, stuck, struck home. That was what struck and stuck those scriptures in my heart. But then I went back to the secret place. And God knew what I needed. It was many years later when I finally got myself to that point. But God knew what I needed. Because my faith was still in there. <clears throat> I'd been in church since I was three days old. God had said his word. That seed had been planted and increased. I had been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Had spoken tongues. Had spent many years singing. Reading scriptures for my dad. Honey scriptures. That faith was in there. I had to believe. Even when I was out in the world, I believed. I knew there was a reason. I knew there was a purpose. I had to believe. That's the second thing God wants you to do. First, you need to hear it. Then you need to believe it. Hear it, then believe it. The third thing is pray it. And I'm going to go back to James <coughs> chapter 5, where Tony was <coughs> Thursday night. Verse 15. And it says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Now we've gotten faith through hearing the word. And believing the word. Now we have to pray the faith. We have to pray on what we believe. What we've heard. And it says the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It doesn't say it'll, that it will heal the sick. It will save the sick. How many times have you heard of people telling of individuals who are on their deathbed in the last stages of whatever condition they're in, who have not believed on God, who have not turned their life over to God, and the prayer of someone, 
going in and praying with them, they commit and turn their life over to God just before they pass. That is the prayer of faith. We've heard the word, we believe it, and we know that this person needs it before they meet their eternal destiny. And you go in and you speak with that person. You, you speak the word to them so they hear it. Somewhere in there, they have to believe it. And then you pray it on them. And they accept it. That is the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith will save the sick. Any prayer that we pray, if we are a Christian and we hear the word and believe the word, is a prayer of faith. Because we have to believe what we're praying on will come to pass. Just as I said with my mom. I pray that God would heal her. That's what it came down to. Whether that healing came through life or through death, I prayed that God would heal her. My faith was there. It was a prayer of faith. God honors that prayer. And it says, He shall raise them up. That's what happens, folks. We use our faith and we give it out to others and we speak it out to others. We are spreading that word to them and establishing that faith in their life. And at some point, they're going to question just like we did. They're going to question, what have I been doing all this time? And it may be at the last minute of their life. They're going to question somewhere along the lines. Whether they accept Jesus or not, we still have free will. But the prayer of faith will save the sick. It will save them from eternal damnation. But we have to speak it out. We have to offer it out to them. Because if they never hear it, if they don't hear the word ever, then they will never be saved. We can pray over a person all we want to, but until someone speaks that word, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and until someone speaks that word into their life, that seed of faith cannot be established. We have to act upon it and speak so first somebody can hear it. The last thing was <coughs> use it. Act on it. Going back here to the scripture with the woman with the issue of blood. You know, verse 27 said, When she heard Jesus, when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press and touched his garment. She heard the word. Then she believed it. And then she acted upon it. Right? She was a woman that could not be in public. She was for all accounts unclean. Had been for 12 years. Had been basically what we would consider ostracized. Probably the best definition of what this woman would have went, went through. Everything she touched was considered unclean. And any other Jew could not touch that same thing until it had been cleansed. It had to go through a, a ceremony of cleansing via the Levitical law. And if you did touch something that she had touched or had touched or been touched by her, then you had to go through that same ceremony of cleansing that was established in Levitical law. And you were considered unclean for a period of time. She was unclean. She was basically ostracized. She could not really be around people for fear that they would also become unclean. So you can imagine, if the law tells you, you cannot touch her, you cannot touch anything she's touched, you, or you become unclean, then you have to do this, this, and this, what would you do? You would probably stay away from her. 
Makes you wonder if she had any friends at all. Anyone that talked to her. Probably not even her family. Really. Twelve years she was alone. But somebody spoke the word. Somebody spoke Jesus, which is the word made flesh. Probably somebody going by her house, and she overheard it. But somebody spoke the word. She probably kept hearing these conversations about this prophet, this man named Jesus. He's healing everybody he's come in contact with. He's teaching these words that is radical. Because Jesus' words were radical in that day. She heard the word. The seed was planted. And somewhere in hearing the word, what had been going on, she heard Jesus was here. Amen. And she believed. She believed it. If only, if only I can just touch with the hem of his garment, just the bottom of his robe, Amen. I know I can be made whole. She believed it. She was a she was a desperate woman. She had she fit everything she had, mm -hmm. and she was down to nothing. You know, and that's why a lot of people have to get before they can find Jesus. They had to hit the bottom hit of the, the barrel. She just bottom. She had no hope. But that's the only hope she, she had. Was the, the and that's why we should never give up on a child of God. Yeah. Because she had, she had spent everything. She was at the bottom, had nothing more, and now she heard the word. How many people in our lives do we know that have nothing more? They're at the bottom. And there's nothing more they can do. We need to speak that word. Amen. Speak it into their lives. Because this is an example of someone who was at that point in their lives. They were at the bottom. Everything was gone. Nothing had made it better. And how much pain and suffering do you think this lady went through in the 12 years? Medical procedures were not as advanced back then as they are now. The medical procedures we go through now are not pleasant. Imagine what she went through 2,000 years ago. For 12 years, she had suffered many things at the hand of many <coughs> physicians. She had went through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. We do the same thing in our spiritual lives. We go through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and suffer many things at the hand of many other people. But she heard the word. She heard Jesus was coming. She heard the man who'd been healing everybody was here. She heard that her only other option, one last hope, was here. And she believed that this man, who was the Word, could heal her. All I have to do is get to him. All I have to do is get there. And I will be healed. Come on. And she stepped out. Come on. That's where we can hear it. Again. We can believe it. We can pray it. But until we act upon it right. and we step out on it, again. nothing's going to happen. Right. That is the beginning of the use of our faith. Amen. My dad had heard it. My dad believed it. Sure, my dad had prayed it. But until he took that one step out and said, God, use me, and opened his mouth, his faith wasn't complete. We have to act upon it. We don't get salvation by works. But the Bible does tell us Faith without works is dead. Salvation is a gift from God. But faith is a gift as well because a seed is planted. We have to do something with it. We either have a seed 
but we have a tree that's in full bloom. Faith without works is dead. If you do not act upon that faith and use it as God has instructed us, your faith is dead. You can believe it. You can hear it. You can pray it. But it's just lip service. How many Christians sit in churches today? They believe there's a God. They hear the word. You know, they may come every Sunday morning, go to Sunday school, and listen to teachings, listen to it on the TV. They hear the word. They go through their daily prayers and pray it. Lord, heal this person. Lord, move in this situation. But have they ever acted upon it? How many don't act upon it and sit there and become cold? Come on. How many people do that every week and then sit back and wonder, what's happened? Why am I not where I was before? Why do I not feel the presence of God like I had before? Why is our services not full of the Spirit like they had been before? Why is everything coming up against me and nothing seems to be going the way I thought it would? Why? 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 I'll tell you why. Faith without works is dead. And without a faith in God, without your faith being there and growing and being fed by the Word, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, without that faith, how can we ever have a firm belief in something that can never be proven? If faith without works is dead, then we've lost everything we have. So many people today think you can come to a church and sit here and you'll be all right. That's not the case. You have to do something about it. You have to step out. If it just means that you take that one step to step out and say, I need prayer. Come on. One step to walk up to somebody and say, I'm praying for you. Give somebody a hug. Give somebody a smile. Say, Jesus loves you. <clears throat> to say, someone out in this world, a cashier, have a blessed day. God bless you. You're doing something with your faith. You're speaking it out. You're acting upon it. You're showing Christ in your life. When you do nothing, your faith dies. The Word tells us that. And we become cold. Our hearts get hardened. Come on. And we still come in this church. Come on. And then we wonder, why is it not the way it was? You know, I talked to you a while back about existing or persisting. There's a time in our lives when we are going to just exist. And at that point in time in our lives, there's not going to be a lot of works coming out of us. We go through seasons. We're up on the mountain, down in the valley. Where, however you look at it, we go through dry places. And all we can do is hang on and exist. Exist through it. There's not a lot of works that come out of us, but you know what? Just existing is a testament to your faith. Amen. You just can't stay there. There is a time and a season to exist, to temporarily go through whatever it is you're going through. But you can't stay there. You have to come out of it. And you have to come out of it stronger and ready to go again and step out and do the works God has for you. If you stay there, you just persist. And if you just exist, if you stay there, you just exist. And if you just exist, you've lost 
your faith. Hear it. Believe it. Pray it. And use it. Make sure that you use it. You act upon it. And God will open up so much for you. Put it in there, yeah. Tell, but he'd give me a dollar. He's trying to get a whipping. 
I don't know. I'm gonna be in trouble for this one. But brother Pat. No, Gene. Gene, I'm sorry. Had a birthday last yesterday. Was it yesterday? It was the twelfth. Twelfth. Seventy-seven years old. And he didn't want me. He said it was embarrassing to walk out to a church. So he gave him a dollar and he, he said, said, "Don't you tell this nobody." Is from somebody to know. <laughs> so his brother Gene's birthday. Do you have an announcement? Yeah, I was gonna have that. Oh, do you anniversary? Anniversaries. Oh, the anniversary this morning. Anybody want to get married? Look at You're too young, young lady. Thank you. Oh, you're all older. Y'all want to get married? Yeah, that's too likely. Sooner or later. I was going to say, um, Pam and um, Teresa text me. They're on their way to Florida. I'm her. She's, they're the ones that their home burnt down in Florida. Um, they asked for us to pray for their safety and um, that they can get everything settled as they go down. And also, Sister Dennis uh, called me early this morning and said that um, her kidneys are acting up, so um, she wasn't um, able to sleep last night to ask for prayer for her. So let's um, continue to remember them. And then um, there was another. Oh, Becky Soingo's husband, Steve. Um, they're going to do a hip replacement on him on the 25th of June. So remember him. And sister. Uh, um, yeah, my uh, granddaughter got thrown over by her boyfriend. Oh my. And so she's in pretty bad shape. They think she's got hurts in her leg. And they just now found out yesterday she's got a broken ankle also. But she did graduate Wednesday from high school. Well, how do we? Okay. Never know. Do you have any? Well, choir uh, practice directly after church. Uh, there's something else I was going to say that's sitting on mine. I can't remember what it was. Sister Mariah, what do you. No, it's Monica. Monica. What? I'm sorry. That loses Shane's hand and then. No, I'm talking to
so that thou incline that ear into wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. And I, I, as she read that this morning, I thought, <clears throat> you know, it's, when you see your loved one uh, <coughs> suffering and um, going through uh, the things they go through so many different times, it's hard to, to grasp a hold of that faith that you need to grasp a hold of. And I, you know, I, I was talking to Brother Donnie this morning and, uh, about Brother Pat, and I said, I don't know if we will ever truly see the Brother Pat that we've known all these years again. <coughs> he's very confused, and he doesn't know that he's very confused. He thinks I still work. So what you have to do, you have to go along with it. It's very hard sometimes. Because he thinks I'm the one that's confused. Maybe I am. <laughs> I don't doubt that again. But, but anyway, um, it is very, very hard. And, I'm, and so I corrected myself very quickly after saying we might never see that same brother Pat. Because we know God is able to do yes. absolutely yes. anything yes. and everything. We saw yes. so many miracles and we have a great cloud of witnesses yes. that have gone on before us. And so many times we have seen the marvelous works of God. And I, I can remember a young man in Tennessee who was in a terrible car wreck and the doctors all said his brain waves is, is dead. He has no... No, uh, he's not alive. The only thing's keeping him is his um, the machines that's keeping him because there's no brain waves. And his he had just got finished a concert, a gospel concert, when he was in the red. And um, his mom and dad were great faith believers, and they said we will not connect disconnect him because we believe God can raise him up. And God absolutely did raise him up. Went back to playing music and singing gospel music. So we we know God is able to do anything. So I know God is able to do a miracle. And, but it's yet sometimes when the doctors are are saying, well, you know, he might have a year. It's hard. Very very hard. Uh, but I know God can. You know, I do not believe God is done with him. I don't I have said that all along. I don't believe God is done with him. No. Uh, but you know what? If he is, it will be God's will. Uh, whatever God wants. Our church will continue on. Uh, you know, uh, until God sent, until we feel like God has sent us someone to be the pastor, we will continue just like we are. Amen. 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 And like I said, we don't know. We do not, you know, it'd be wonderful if we knew exactly what God was going to do. <laughs> yeah. Amen. It would be great if at all times we knew. But you know what? He don't want us to know. Amen. His ways is above Amen. our ways. Amen. His ways, hallelujah, Amen. we do not understand. But yet we know that he's, we know he's in control. Absolutely. He's the only one that truly is in control. He knows all things. And I really don't want to know my future. Me neither. You know? Because I know what he, that what he knows for my future is best. Amen. You know, so whatever God's will is, that's exactly what we will have. Uh, most of the time, Brother Pat knows what you're talking about. Uh, he, I mean, he's he's awake and he's alert. Um, he sleeps a lot, but when he is awake, he is alert. He just is confused. Uh, for a while, he was stuck in 1978. Yeah, we couldn't figure out why he was stuck in 1978 all the time, and we still really don't know. But he does know now that it's 2014. And he did actually say it is the month of June yesterday. So yeah, so they ask him quite often different questions. And most of the time he answers pretty good. He does know who he is this time. Uh, but he has been to the point that he didn't even know his own name. And uh, he is feeding himself and everything. And it was really, you know, some things is really sort of funny. He's eating yogurt with fork. <laughs> I said, let me give you 
uh, this. I said, won't you take this spoon there? He said, no, I want to eat it with my fork. <laughs> Okay. So then the nurse comes along, she said, well, Pat, it would be so much easier to get that out and to eat it with this spoon. He said, I said, I would eat it with my fork. <laughs> okay, eat it with your fork. You know. <laughs> but you know what, that sounds like a silly little thing, don't it? The way it is, to look at it. But to him, that was important to eat that yes. yogurt, that fork. So... God, you, God is such a great God, and, and uh, I appreciate all that our kids, our kids have been wonderful, and I appreciate the church for all the prayers, and that everybody hasn't been running in to see, because it is hard, it, it is hard, and so I, we, you know, really, truly, if you want to come and see him, that's fine, but I would prefer you just pray for him, uh, because, of, you know, we... <laughs> There's eight of our kids, and uh, of course, Sister Lisa's not going to be with us too much at the hospital, taking care of Sean, and Sean is doing good. Um, he is swelling, some of the swelling in his leg has gone down, so the pain is more intensified than it was, but uh, he, is, he still has a 50-50, doctors are still saying 50-50 chance of losing his leg, but we're believing 100% that God is able. Uh, so far, things look good. The muscles look really good and healthy, they say. It's the skin that they were worried about. So we know God is, is able to do all things. Sister Early, are you leaving? Um, yeah, Autumn's graduation things. Oh, okay. Just a minute. Okay. I'll talk to you. Okay. Love you. I love you, too. Um, Sister, if you don't know, Sister Erlene has been taking care of the food pantry. And I did want to make a statement that um, if you come in, to, and I know there's a few people that do have keys to the food pantry, or to the fellowship hall, if you come in and take a food basket out of the fellowship hall for a needy family, that's wonderful, that's great. But we would like to know where it's going and who is taking it. So you either get a hold of Sister Earlene or you write a note and we would like the people's name that you are giving it to and the date. Uh, we do have a form that we fill out and the people are allowed to get a basket once a month. And uh, So anyway, I know she said she had made up some baskets and she went back in and there was some missing. And I said, well, I have an idea who probably got it, but, uh, you know, I don't know. But anyway, so if you do take food out or you know that you're getting food out of the pantry, um, just please let us know. I don't think anybody's no. coming in there robbing us or anything, but you know, but it just, it makes it good when you, you try to keep a file on, on who does it. You know, if you ever get in trouble, please don't feel bad about having to ask to get some food. That's not what I'm saying. That's just, we like to have an idea of who, who is getting food. Yeah. So I told Sister Early that I would do that. Um, and I'm sure I'll get back to doing it real soon. This has been a real hard with trying to move. Um, and everything that we've been going through with, uh, with all this illness. And, uh, so it has been hard, but God has given us the strength to do these things. Uh, God, God will strengthen you and make you uh, able in all ways. And we trust God and we believe His Word. And, and like I said, that was a wonderful word this morning. I really needed it to because it is, it's a faith walk and it is hard when you're not when you're you know I've been out of church two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago today we came to church, Brother Pat and I did. My Bible was still laying there where I left it uh, on Sunday morning two weeks ago. But so it's been two weeks. I'm not saying I haven't been as much in prayer and in my word because I even even if I don't take this Bible with me here, I have my Bible on my Kindle and, and I read it every day. And um, and I like you know my Kindle fits nicely in my purse, so I can take it out every time I want to to read the Word of God. So um, I I appreciate and you know. Several people have really done, our kids have really been good. Um, our son-in-law and our son is, you know, they're always slipping me at 20 to either buy food or buy gas or 
whatever I need. I mean, you know, it, it, it runs into money when you're uh, eating at the hospital and uh, driving. If, if I come home, I've not been, not been home every night, but most of the time the kids say, you go home, I end up getting sick and I'm having to go to the doctor myself with bronchitis. Thank God, God's good. Amen. But, uh, you know, uh, it takes a toll on you. It truly does. It takes a toll on you when you do that. But anyway, he is out of ICU and he's in a regular room. Good. And, well, sometimes that's good and sometimes that's yeah. not so good. When they're in ICU, you know they're uh, uh, better taken care of, right? But uh, sometimes you have a good nurse and sometimes you want to have one that you can ring the bell and you'll say, well, you have to wait a minute. And well, if you've got to go to the bathroom, sometimes you don't have time to wait a minute. <laughs> but, and when you're so weak, you can't get yourself out of bed and you have an alarm on your bed, you know. So anyway, there's just a lot of things going on. But people have been really, really good. Uh, a friend I hadn't seen in uh, many, many years came by the other day and gave me a $50 gift card for Walmart. Uh, if I needed to buy gas or if we needed to get something, and I just thought that was very, very precious. Uh, we did read him every one of the little messages that all of you wrote on your card that uh, was sent to him. And uh, our doctor even sent him, uh, our family doctor sent him a beautiful card with everybody in the office and signed it and wrote little messages on it. So, so he's been getting some uh, nice cards and with all of us, we appreciate every prayer that has gone out. People's praying all over the United States just about. I thank God. God. God is a great God and He is able to take care. And we do have to have the faith to believe no matter what it looks like, you know, the doctor's faith. I said it'd be alright. If you just have one doctor, that would be great. But when you're when you've got so many things going off and you're in a hospital, you got a heart doctor, you got a uh, liver doctor, you've got a, a doctor over the ward, uh, whether you're in ICU, whether you're on the floor, you've got a, got a doctor, you got a doctor. Nobody tells you the same thing. One will say, well, pneumonia level's not not really what we're watching. It's, it's uh, uh, as much as uh, uh, how his response is and, and how alert he is. And, I said, but when the ammonia level shoots through the sky, last Sunday it was 254 when we got him to the hospital. <coughs> a, a normal level is 16 to 60. So uh, needless to say, he really didn't know his name or anything too much. But uh, <laughs> it'd be great if all the doctors were in agreement with every yes. single thing. Yes. Yes. And they did go in and close off part of the mm -hmm. shunt that they had originally put in. They did that Thursday. And so far we haven't saw any great improvement of the procedure. So uh, whether they will, they, you know, according to the doctors, they do not know how much that it will um, help. So anyway, we're doing a, supposed to, supposed to do a biopsy on his liver tomorrow. So, and hopefully that will be able to determine whether this fluid was coming from his heart or from his liver or... <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. It's one doctor will say one thing. Well, there's probably a lot of it's from the heart. Well, probably it's all from the liver. <laughs> but God knows exactly what it's from. Amen. And he's able, absolutely, to take care. And I'll tell you one thing. He has never quit calling on Jesus. Jesus, my Lord. Jesus, my Lord. And they said the other night, brother, um, our son-in-law, Ricky, said, all night long he called for Michael. And we cannot figure who Michael is unless he was calling for the archangel Michael. Oh, my. And one day we thought he was talking, he was talking about his dad. And we think maybe he was talking about the Heavenly Father rather than, and he was talking about a body bag. And, uh, so see, I mean, uh, it's, uh, you don't know really whether he's really talking about a body bag or if he's really talking about something else. But, uh, yeah. So we never figured out who Michael is. And uh, 
Uh, Brother Mike, you don't call him Michael. He calls him Brother Mike. We only have one person in our whole family that's named Michael. And, and we very some, and he don't ever just call him Michael. He was Michael Lee. So we don't know who he was talking to, but he sure was calling on him. Uh, <laughs> Friday night, they, uh, Brother Rick said it. He talked to him. Called on Michael. Michael and Daisy May. <laughs> That's what I said. It's amazing because he think he'll hear nurses or somebody out in the hall, and he'll think it's uh, you know he'll think it's Green or Lisa or Katrina and Jerry. He thought Katrina was out in the hall. I said no, Katrina's not out in the hall. Buddy. And Tim and, and he said Tim and George was out here, and I said no, honey, they've not been here. And so sometimes I never know really whether it has been someone that has been there. Uh, bro uh, Brother Eddie Carr, who was our former pastor, him and his wife came in, and I knew they had been there earlier, and but I didn't know they had been back in. And so he said they'd been there, and I said, had they really been there? But they had been. <laughs> but so most people he knows, David Alice Forster came up and brought a prayer cloth. So a lot of different ones has, has came and, and visited with him and brought him prayer claws and prayed with him. And Brother Ricky the other night, he said, you know, he said, uh, people that are in the church, they've got a pastor. But a pastor don't have a pastor. And he said, so I'm going to stay. I don't want nobody here Friday, uh, Friday night. He said, I'm going to stay and I'm going to be a pastor tonight to your pastor. So... So he spent, he spent all night praying with him and talking. But like I said, he has not lost faith in Jesus. That's right. He knows that God is able. So even in all of his confusion and not to understanding and didn't even know his name, he still knew who Jesus was. Amen. Amen. Choir. Choir, we're going to do that one song, please. Talk better than our God. 